Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today, we're going to be chatting sourdough. Now, just when you think you've heard everything there is to know about sourdough, if you follow along with the blog, my Instagram, I do talk about sourdough a lot because it is something that has brought a lot of joy and deliciousness to our kitchen. Anya from Our Gabled Home, she has a whole different take on it. She grew up in Germany. She grew up around sourdough. Her mom, her grandma did it. She didn't know there was any different way of doing it than the way that she did it. And it's way different than all of us are doing it here in the modern day. So if you've had trouble with sourdough, you feel like you've never had success with a bubbly starter, maybe this will be something completely different that you can try out and see if you can have some success. So join me as Anya and I chat all things sourdough. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Well, thanks, Anya, for joining me again. I know I've had you here on the podcast before. At the moment, I can't remember. I think it was sourdough we talked about last time, wasn't it? Oh, it was more like spring recipes. Okay. It was a little bit of sourdough. Yeah. Yeah. I knew it was something pertaining to food. Okay. Well, welcome back on the podcast. I'm super excited to have you on to talk about sourdough. Now, before people are like, oh, we've heard enough about sourdough. Anya has some methods that might help you to make it a little bit more straightforward. And if, if sourdough has confused you, because I know at first just the concept alone can be really confusing, we're going to clear that up and hopefully make it to where you feel very confident, especially in the winter. It's a really good time to experiment when you're in the house with sourdough baking. So Anya, let's start off by you introducing yourself. Tell us about you, your blog, your YouTube channel, or whatever else you want to share. Yeah, thank you. It's always so fun to be here. It's uh, what we live for, at least I do. <laughs> yeah. So my name is Anya, and I am, I like to say, I'm the main peddler behind the blog Our Gabled Home. Our Gabled Home, sometimes I gerbil it up a little bit when I <laughs> say it too fast. And the YouTube channel with the same name, Our Gabled Home, and then social media is all the same. And I grew up in Germany, and... I'll talk about this a little bit because I basically cannot remember ever learning sourdough because it was always around me. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then since my mid-20s or so, I have been in the United States and I have taught a lot of people how to do sourdough and they love it and I love it when they love it. So that actually makes my day when I hear people successfully baking breads and getting bubbles in their sourdough starter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've been baking sourdough long before the 2020 craze of sourdough. And with that, you've probably encountered lots of questions. I get lots of questions in my DMs. I get pictures of sourdough starters. I get emails with people that have questions. What are some of the top mistakes that you see new sourdough bakers make? Wow, I get so many questions too all the time. And in my comments and emails and blog comments and YouTube comments, so I think the first thing I want to tell people is don't ever give up. And here's a little secret that most people don't talk about is that if you have never made a sourdough starter in your kitchen or you've never baked with sourdough, you may not have a lot of ambient wild yeasts in your kitchen. So your first sourdough starter may actually be the hardest. It's almost like a little hump you have to come over. Huh. And because at this point, I feel like I can do anything with my sourdough that I want. And I've only right. gotten mold on my sourdough once. And I can tell you exactly why, because I had a, an apple that was a little moldy on the underside and that was pretty close to my sourdough starter. So that can actually happen. Okay. Um, so when people get mold on their sourdough starters and they ask me about it, I will tell them, make sure you don't have anything moldy accidentally nearby in the vicinity. Okay. And sourdough is really robust. So there's a lot of other things that can go wrong, if you have a very young, not very robust sourdough starter and you're using city water that has been treated with chlorine, that can actually inhibit the proliferation of these lactobacillus, the good bacteria that we're trying to cultivate. Same with bleached flowers. And I have this progression. So white unbleached flower, then the next best is organic 
white flour. I'm trying to think that I'm saying it right. And then organic whole wheat flour. And if you really want to get your sourdough starter on steroids, you use organic whole grain rye flour. <laughs> wow, that was a lot. And what other mistake? Yeah, just not experimenting enough. Do you find that the rye, is a, are there more active yeast in that grain? You know, now you're asking me something that I don't really know the answer to. Um, I, it just does. That's fine too. It just, it just does. <laughs> There's a few things that I know that work, but I can't tell you exactly why they work. But rye flour, even white rye flour is really conducive to a good sourdough starter. So if you're trying for the first time and then you can eventually switch over, you know, that's another thing I often get questions like, oh, can I, you know, switch from one grain to another? It's like, yeah, totally. You can switch back and forth and there's a transition period. Yeah. Do it all the time. Yeah, exactly. So. And in, in what way would you say there's a transition period? I always, I don't know. I think it's because I am working with a 12 year old sourdough starter that it is so robust that I cannot mess it up. There's just been, there's just no way. Like I could put it in the back of the fridge for months. I could, not that I have, because I'm right. like not one of those people who ever needs a break from starter. I always see people that are like, well, my life was really busy. To me, it's so easy to maintain that it's definitely one of the last things to go when life is really busy. There's a lot of other things that would go first, which which do. But yeah, with, with feeding it different grains, I just throw in whatever. And it always is just fine. It yeah. just bubbles right up. It has the fuel it needs. Yeah. Yeah, I find the same. I mean, I can I can not use my sourdough starter, and that's partly because of my method for weeks and weeks, and um, and I can do whatever I want with it, and I never had any problems. I feel like, you know, my sourdough is at this point a well-trained pet <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that does whatever I want. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's where you want it to be. In what ways do you feel that people overcomplicate sourdough starter? And in fairness, I understand that it's a very... It's a simple concept when you're first trying to understand it. Just understanding the science behind it's really important because otherwise it's like whenever my kids, I'm teaching a math, you know, we homeschool and they're trying to memorize the formulas right. and I'm like, no, 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 stop. Think about why that is like, try to think back to right. why, if I was logically thinking about this math problem, would this totally make sense? It's the same way with sourdough starter in a way, because a lot of the questions I get, it's the questions are because somebody doesn't understand what's happening and they just want all of the rules and the steps. But I'm like, wait, wait, wait. If we think about what sourdough starter is, what you're trying to cultivate, what it does, then it actually is very intuitive. So that's what right. are, yeah. What are some of the ways that you feel people overcomplicate it? So, I mean, the first thing to think about is that the way I learned sourdough was, um, you know, I was kind of, you know, like tall enough to peek over the kitchen counter and watching my mom do it. So it was really natural. And then when I was older, mm -hmm. I remember her saying, oh, I'm going to have to go here and there. If you can put, you know, the dough from the bread bowl into the loaf pan and or she would ask me, you know, I'm going to be out for so many hours. And when the bread has risen enough, can you put it in the oven and start the baking? And so I naturally grew up, I had an idea of what the sourdough should look like and the sourdough starter. Right. And I naturally... and the timeline. Right. And now you have people who don't have that. And then you have instructions. Right. And the instructions are, to me, they're super complicated. And, uh, and I never too. knew there was <laughs> another sourdough method until maybe five years ago, because I always mm -hmm. thought everybody does sourdough the way I do it. Same. Yeah. Um, now people go off books and in a book they have to um, take out as much guesswork as possible or if you're teaching it on your channel or on your blog right and so then again if you have a very humid house or depending on whether you use fresh milk flour or store-bought flour you're even if you use the exact measurements there is a little bit of needing to feel for the sourdough and looking at what you have and understanding what consistency, like you said, with the math concept, it's like, what are you, what are you trying to achieve? What is the mm -hmm. sourdough starter consistency supposed to look like instead of like, oh, I measured 50 grams of this and 75 grams of that, and that's the end of it. So while there probably isn't a better method other than showing it in a video, what it's supposed to look like. I feel like people who are new to sourdough, they should 
use whatever recipe they can find, a method that they resonate with that seems great to them, and then just get started and then just experiment. And if it doesn't turn out, start over again, ask some more questions, feel it, but um, don't ever give up. Yeah. And I always say French toast casserole, bread pudding, and croutons. There's no reason to ever throw sourdough out for any reason whatsoever. Bread crumbs. And like you said, with humidity levels, with the type of flour you're using, there are so many variables. And I run into this a lot on my blog where somebody will give the recipe like a one-star review and they'll say, this didn't work at all. And I'm like, you really... It's because you don't know how to do this yet. I mean, I'm just saying I've made this recipe like a hundred times and I understand there's a learning curve, but it is like you need to know how to feel the dough. And it's something I can't go into your house and show you. You do just have to keep trying it until you have that feel for yourself. Um, Another question I get, which is I feel like it's not understanding the concept behind starter. And you can tell me if, if you get this question a lot too. People say, well, why instead of discarding it when they're starting a starter, Why not take that half and then feed it and make two sourdough starters? And that's where I'm like, oh, we need to go back to square one if that's the question, right? Do you get that question too? Yeah, yeah, totally. And the reason that bakers uh, maybe 20, 30, maybe 50 years ago um, all switched to yeast was because yeast was dependable and sourdough wasn't. And with sourdough, depending on, you know, the temperature and you know, things you can control, the humidity and maybe your own mood and uh, whatever, you know, the the kind of approach you take on that day all affect your sourdough starter and your sourdough baking. But if you really want a dependable product, that's where yeast comes in. And that's when people switch to yeast because, you know, you could just be completely exact and the recipe would always come out the same Mm -hmm. and not for sourdough. Right, exactly. And with that being said, I still find that everything ends up edible. I I don't think I've ever fully thrown something away. Even whenever I've had over-fermented dough, which still happens to me because I'll forget about something, it sits on the counter, and then, you know, it turns into that sloppy mess when it over-ferments. I will take that and make it into like a flatbread or a fry bread or something. You know, we don't just throw it away. There's always something you could do. You could spread that un- that over-fermented dough on top of like a beef and vegetable thing, maybe add some cheese, you know. Yeah. Or like I said, you know, dry it and turn it into breadcrumbs. Perfect use for it. Yeah. And then again, you know, I'm German, so we grow up with this very dense whole grain bread. So we are not shying away from dense breads that we actually need to use our teeth for. And um, right. if I experiment with a new recipe, because I'm just like, okay, so let me, let me try if I, you know, I actually did experiment a lot with a hundred percent rye, uh, whole, whole grain rye recipe. And my first one came out a little bit on the dense side. It was delicious. And then I just cut the slices a little thinner and then it's not so bad, but yeah, right. like, like you, I don't think I've ever thrown out a bread that didn't turn out well. Yeah. Yeah. One of the most common misconceptions with sourdough is that you have to keep discarding. And this is sort of the topic of this conversation. You were telling me about your method. So tell us about your method that does not require any discarding. Well, one of the reasons I don't have, I can't claim to have a, you know, 50 year old starter is because even making my starter is so easy that if I don't have it for a while or let's say I moved from Germany to here, or, you know, I moved and then I just like, oh, you know, I can easily make a new starter. I, you know, it's so easy that I just don't have an old starter. Mm -hmm. And I actually use buttermilk and a little bit of water and flour. And I don't tell people exactly how much to use of each. I said, ah, just, you know, I'm the queen of eyeballing. Right. Just put a little in a bowl and this is the consistency that you want. I always tell them you're going for a thick pancake batter. And then mm-hmm. all you do is keep it in a nice warm spot, not hot, just warm enough. And even in the winter, I've tried making it in the winter just to replicate and see what it would do for me. I just keep it in a sunny windowsill or um, if the kitchen is too cold because we don't have heat in the kitchen, I may move it closer to a heat source and then just do it there. And then every so often you stir it like maybe every day, maybe every other day, but I don't discard anything. And then in my house, I get a good sourdough starter after five or six days. I would assume that people who've never made a sourdough starter in their home and never had one, it may actually take up to 10 days. And I recently had a lady 
emailing me back and forth on Instagram and she's like, I'm so frustrated. I'm using your method. And she signed up for my course and, you know, and she just couldn't get it right. And then she emailed me and she said, oh my gosh, all of a sudden bubbles. <laughs> and so that can happen. And then what I do is once I have that starter, I bake with it. I bake with most of it. And even my breads are, you know, like I grind my grains and then I add ah, whatever I have on hand. And then I just watch my bread. If the bread doesn't rise enough, then I'll just let it rise longer. And I've never had, I mean, I start in the morning and I bake in the evening. I've never had to stay up late because my bread hadn't risen enough. It's more to the contrary where I'm like, oh my gosh, it's three o'clock, but I'm not actually ready to bake because I need to still do some things and I don't have time to be here for an hour and a half and then take it out. So I don't have, I mean, I, on my blog, the recipes have measurements and everything. But then I take about a golf ball size or so and add a lot of flour to it. And when people ask me how much, I'm like a lot of flour. And then when you think it's too much, you pile some more flour on top and you stick it in the refrigerator and then you can keep it there. I have easily kept it for six weeks and taken it out the night before I bake and add water to it. So essentially, the way I'm looking at it, is I am separating the feeding into the dry and the water. So you're feeding your sourdough started with water and flour, and I'm feeding it with flour. And then when I'm ready to bake, I'm adding the water. And then the night before, I add the water, I stir it up, and then in the morning, it's ready to bake. And then the cycle continues. So it's, it's pretty much the only way I've ever done sourdough. I didn't know that other people would do a different method. And when I talk to my mom in Germany these days, she and her very German... Um, way of talking about it. it's like hmm, people really do that interesting <laughs> so she's still in disbelief that people actually feed and discard or discard and feed yeah <laughs> so whenever you're starting the sourdough starter how are you giving it consistent fuel are you just doing really tiny amounts that you can still give it more flour without having to discard when you're starting i don't actually feed it for some reason with the buttermilk it doesn't need feedings. It just, um, I guess the cultures in the buttermilk, and here's a question that I get a lot because of my method. People ask me, can I use the buttermilk that I make from lemon juice or vinegar and flour? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, flour and milk. And that's not the same that is curdled. And we need the active cultures mm -hmm. that are somehow doing it. And then I have another thing that I can't tell you why it works. I add caraway seeds to my sourdough starter and caraway seeds will absolutely, it, it's another way to put steroids into your sourdough starter. It totally gets it going. Hmm. And I've gotten a lot of comments on, um, especially my, one of my sourdough videos where people have actually said, oh yeah, my, my grandmother would take a little ball of sourdough starter and put it in the big bag of flour and just keep it there until the next baking. And people say, oh, yeah, I remember my grandparents or, you know, some ancestors would do it very similar to what you're doing. So I guess maybe it's a more of an old world type of method. I don't know. Yeah. So what would be the difference between that and just keeping a really small amount of starter in what what purpose does the extra flour serve? Because I have been exploring this a lot more lately, the dry sourdough starter. I'm actually writing a blog post all about dry sourdough starter and doing an extremely hmm. non-hydrated, so very flour-dense starter, pulling a little bit out. But what, in my mind, I'm like, well, what's the difference, though, in just keeping like a really small amount in a jar in the back of the fridge and just pulling a tiny amount out of that whenever you want to bake? What's the difference there? Well, I guess my method is perfect for people who don't want to bake when their sourdough starter is ready. They want to bake whenever they're ready to bake. So I guess that's the biggest difference. So and you add the water and then it's ready to bake with just within minutes, but you still have to let it go for like four or five hours, right? To get it active again. We, yeah. So when I okay. take it out the night before I bake, it wouldn't be ready to bake. I need to um, get it going. And I want to say that my sourdough starter is in a semi-dormant state when mm -hmm. I pull it out of the refrigerator because the cold of the refrigerator slows it down and the lack of a lot of moisture slows it down, the lack of the water. So right. I'm adding the water the night before. That's the flour purpose there. Right. And so, I mean, it is, it is nutrients, but it's not 
it's not making it super active. Right, right, right. And then the night before, and people ask me, does it have to be at eight o'clock or can it be 11 o'clock? And I'm like, whatever, you know, I mean, like overnight, Just eight hours bubbly. is fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And right. I always get something going the next morning. I mean, I never have it where I'm looking at my starter the next morning. I'm thinking, hmm. I may not get a sourdough starter that like overflows the jars. And I think there is a bit of a, um, you know, in another life, I um, I'm also a yoga teacher and I always, and I'm going to come back to this in a second, but I want to just do this quick detour. Um, you, you know, you see these uh, super flexible women doing all these incredible poses. And I think it's almost doing most people a disservice because they're like, I could never do that. You know, I could never do yoga. And I'm like, it's not about the poses. And, you know, it's so Instagram perfect. And these days I feel like there is a lot of focus on getting the perfect starter, whatever people think that is, and the perfect loaf of bread. <laughs> and interesting enough, I have that book, The Perfect Loaf. <laughs> and even though I'm trying to come away from that a little bit and thinking, hey, don't get so fixated on, you know, your crust and your crumb and the ear and the, right, right, you know, right. or your sourdough starter that flows out of the, you know, you measure it. And I want to say my sourdough starter is functional. It mm -hmm. may not always be Instagram perfect, but like I said, I've been baking with it for decades right. and so has my mom and so has my grandmother and my great grandmother and whoever else. And, and it's functional. You always get a good bread. And yeah, that's, that's something that that's my little pet peeve. And I got that out of my system. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm curious if you, do you continue to feed it with buttermilk or just when you're first starting it, that jump starts it? Just, just to get the starter going. And then I, okay. I add the water and, you know, the flour before I put it in the refrigerator and then the water when I'm, when I'm ready to take it out. So when you first start it, you do the buttermilk, the flour, you just leave it on the counter, no feedings and just let it wait till it bubbles in like five days. Yep. And I stir it because the air also helps getting the good bacteria going. And if I feel it's a little sluggish or if it's really cold, I may throw some caraway seeds in it. And I know that caraway is not everybody's cup of tea. I am not a big fan of actually biting on a little caraway seed and getting that burst of caraway flavor. I have found that when I'm trying to make a sourdough starter and I put it in at first, it actually quells up and um, you almost can't taste it. But they're pretty visible. If you use white flour, I mean, if you're really against the caraway seed taste, you can always you know, stir around and take a spoon and try to fish out those old seeds. But I've had a lot of people comment to me and say, I've tried to get it going and never did. And then I added the caraway seeds and like, miracle. All of a sudden it worked. Took off. Yeah. 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 I wonder if that works too with like a sluggish starter that isn't started with buttermilk, adding the caraway seeds. I would, I would bet it would. Yeah. Because I don't think that the caraway yeah. seeds have to have a one method. I think they, uh, there's something about it that promotes probably the proliferation of the really good mm -hmm. bacteria, the lactobacillus. Yeah. I I used to always say for years, this was when I first started my starter and I made a YouTube video like five, six years ago about it, that you're capturing the yeast that's in the environment. And I was corrected by a lot of people that it's actually the yeast that's present on the flower. Is there truth to both? I still don't even know exactly on that one because I know it bubbles and I know it, it changes based on environment, but is it mostly the flower or is it the air around that's doing that? I would say it's both. I would say it's both. Yeah. And I've even heard a method that somebody sent to me where people take water and flour, put it in a jar, stir it up, and then put a mesh over it. So not, not really like airtight. And they put it under some trees and I have to go back to that method. Hmm. And there's something on those trees that drops down. And um, so there's definitely ambient wild yeasts in the air and in the flower. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty certain that it's both. Yeah. Taking a break to tell you about today's episode sponsor. You guessed it. I love them and share them all the time. Tubes & Co. Organic Skin Care. If you are looking for clean, simple ingredients in your skincare, which you should be because our skin is our body's largest organ and what goes on the skin actually does make its way in. And so if you are picky about what you eat, you should also be picky about your skincare. I understand though that a lot of times organic and natural skincare, it just doesn't work as well. Your skin is left feeling dry or if it does feel moist, it maybe feels oily you want something that actually works. And the Tubes & Co organic products, like their tallow balm, 
it's made from obviously from an animal from grass fed tallow because of that it actually does absorb in and do the intended purpose of moisturizing your skin i also love their cleansers i'm really loving their makeup i find that the products are beautifully effective so they are natural they are organic but they also work really well and don't leave me feeling like i have a bare face which is not always a bad thing. I have that a lot too. But whenever I wear makeup, I want it to feel like I'm wearing makeup. I want to cover all of the imperfections in my skin. And I have found that in the foundation from Tubes & Co and the different bronzers and highlighters, I'm still getting better at figuring out how to actually apply makeup because that is not something that, I'm not a beauty guru, but I do like to look nice. Tubes & Co. is made in the USA, based in the USA, a small family company. If that's something you love to support like I do, make sure to go over to tubesandco.com. Use the code FARMHOUSE for a discount. Again, tubesandco.com. Use the code FARMHOUSE. Okay, I have another question that people might be wondering. Have you ever kept for many, many years, because you said you can start them just so easily that you don't always keep one, but have you kept for many years one that was started with the buttermilk? And how do you ensure that the yeasts that are present on the flour are the ones that are more prolific than the ones that were in the buttermilk? And does it keep long-term when it started that way? Yeah, it does. Because I've actually had one that was maybe five or six years old and it may get a little bit more pungent. So I... I do have a few books on sourdough because um, when I'm done recording videos about sourdough, I go to bed and I read about sourdough <laughs> <laughs> before I go to sleep. So, yeah. I mean, I can talk about this stuff all day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I heard in, or read in this one book that certain bakers will actually not proudly keep a sourdough starter for 150 years because they find that it gets too strong. So they actually make a new one every so often because they like them better when they're, in, when they're mature, but, but let's say middle-aged, maybe not super old. I've been told this too. Right? <laughs> People are like, yeah. you shouldn't be that proud of your old starter. And I'm like, but it's so robust. And it, it, if I really need to revive it, I just make pancakes or pizza crust, get it down to like next to nothing, feed it yeah. fresh, and it is the most bubbly active starter again. So I'm like, I don't see the point in going through like the five, six day process personally. Right. But I've never had any trouble keeping it alive, you know? Right. That's, to me, you could just reduce it down to this, throw it in the back of your fridge and forget it for six months and it's still fine when it's at that robust stage. So it's really not that... It just doesn't feel like a big burden. No, and, and I feel like that is when you're so comfortable with your sourdough, you can do anything with it. And you also, you know what you're looking for. And if you have kept your sourdough started that long, you know, and then you drain it almost to like next to nothing. And uh, which is interesting because somebody was telling me, oh, my ancestors, you know, insert whatever they were. They kept a jar and they scraped out the jar, but then they left a little bit in the jar dry and when they were ready for the next bread, they would add flour and water to it and they would just get enough uh, of the cultures from the sides of the jar right. that yeah. that was enough. Mm -hmm. But yeah, my other thing is, um, you know, I am in California. So, you know, there's this whole thing about the San Francisco sourdough starter. And right. apparently this one bakery has a 150 year old starter and they sell it online. You can get it on Etsy. But they have found that within like four or five feedings, the bacterial makeup has nothing to do with the original starter that you bought. Okay, interesting. So while it it's old, you know, it, it's not it gets you a jump start. Yeah, yeah. Huh. That that is some interesting science behind that. Well, then it depends on cuz there's one guy and I have his book and I forget what his name is, but um it's a big tome and he said he actually took a uh, San Francisco sourdough starter and had it had it in that, analyzed in a lab and then he took it to the East Coast and he said because of the flour that I'm using and the water that I'm using and the ambient yeast that I have within like four feedings or so, it had nothing to do with the original starter. There was nothing left hmm. of the original bacterial count or, um, you know, the types of bacteria that were in it in, in the lab test, which I thought was highly interesting. 
Yeah, I can see that the biggest biggest benefit of keeping a sourdough starter going long term is just it is very robust. You can't mess it up. You don't have to worry that it won't make your next loaf of bread rise because it's just so consistent. Right. And one thing you were talking about was not having to wait till the middle of the night to bake your bread and various other timeline problems. I get that question a lot. What are some tips, and I have mm-hmm. a few to share myself, but what are some tips that you have on sourdough timeline? Because that really blows people's minds sometimes. So I have this super flexible timeline that is always the same structure. It may not be the same to the minute. And that is I get up in the morning. That can be seven o'clock. Sometimes it's as late as nine o'clock because I do something else beforehand. Uh, grind my grains and I uh, make the dough and then I'll let it sit for three or four hours, depending on when I do it. And depending on when I get home or, you know, if I'm out and about and I get home and then I transfer it into the loaf pan um, because, well, I have, this is, this is my absolute like, signature bread that I grew up on and it's a whole grain, very German style type of bread. And so that, that you can't really do okay. um, because it's whole grain and the way it's, um, the recipe works, you bake it in a loaf pan because otherwise you would just end up with this flat pancake that would be pretty hard. Right, right. Um, then I let it sit somewhere. So I look at it every so often when I walk by. And if it's not doing much, if it's not doming on top, I may move it to another spot. Um, and then if it really isn't doing much, I have also, you know, when I've started cooking dinner, I've kept it close to the stove. Or when I'm baking something, I put it on top of the stove because the heat from the oven will come up to the stove top and then I can mm-hmm. put it there. Yes. I tell people, you know, if you have a pilot light in your oven, you can put it in there that may put out enough heat. Or if you have an oven light, turn that on or turn your oven to the lowest setting, let it go for five minutes and then turn it off and then Mm -hmm. put your bread in there, close the door really fast. People have, I don't know, put it on a like a hot water bottle or a warming plate. I mean, once you start thinking about what your sourdough sort of needs, you can get so creative. And I've even used a little step stool and put my bread right over. We have this um, forced air heating over a heater vent. And then I just have to make sure that it doesn't dry out on top. Mm-hmm. But I mean, yeah, you can get so creative in finding ways how to keep it warm. And I will say a wetter dough will rise easier than a drier mm-hmm. dough. Yeah. So what, what do you do if, say, it is like 10 o'clock at night and your dough hasn't risen to your liking? That's a tough question because it's never happened to me. Yeah, it never happens um, to you? <laughs> no, it, it's never happened. I don't know. I mean, I probably... Well, hint, it, I throw it in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. Um, if that ever happens Just to me, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's never happened to me. So... I'm just not that methodical as you. I start sourdough. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I should be my starter and it's noon. And then it's like bubbly at nine o'clock or just whatever timeline. I'm, I'm never thinking about it. I always just start it. And then wherever it ends up when I'm ready to do the next thing, I, I'll throw it in the fridge or I'll let it do a, a longer first rise. But like, you know, it doesn't, it's not something I think about too much. I don't overly stress about it. I kind of just start something and then it always ends up fine. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. And since I have my routine, I don't, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a routine person. Yeah. And then once I find that I have something in my routine, I don't even have to think about it anymore. So this whole idea, it's like the day before I decide, okay, so we're low on bread. I need to bake more bread. And then I just know, it's almost like my body knows that I have to take the starter out of the kitchen like before. But then there are days when I'm like, oh, you know, we're doing something tomorrow and I won't be able to bake bread. So that has happened and then I just bake on another day. But I have also taken out the sourdough starter in the morning and then ground my grains at night and then let it rise overnight. And then I've baked it like, you know, midday the next day. So I just moved everything up a few hours and... I've done that too, but for some reason that felt a little bit like, you know, when you're always using your right hand, you're using your left hand. It's like, it feels weird. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Very unnatural. Very unnatural. (laughs) That makes a lot of sense. Another rule that I break regularly, and this is just, you're just not allowed to do this. I will take my starter out of the refrigerator and just use it in a recipe. And it works. I I mean, not if it's been like hibernating for six months, but if it's been in the fridge for say a week or so, and I haven't had the chance to feed it yet, sometimes I'll take my chances and it does still rise the bread. 
Yeah. So. Yeah, it's almost like um, you have this relationship with your starter and your starter knows exactly what to do. Like it's a well-trained pet. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. Like I said, we have no heat source in the kitchen. So in the winter, it gets really cold in the kitchen. It can be like 57 in there at night. And I still don't have any trouble with my starter, even though ideally it should be between... Yeah, like the next day there might not be any bubbles or... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't have... I, I never had any issues. The only time I ever had an issue is when I actually did. And it wasn't it wasn't on a mature starter. It was on a, an einkorn starter. And I tried various other methods because people have also come to me and said, I can't find buttermilk because people from other countries, I guess buttermilk is not that common in stores or they can't buy the cultures online or mm-hmm. they have a dairy sensitivity or allergy. What can I use? So I have experimented with other right active cultures such as yogurt and kefir. And then I thought, okay, so what's a non-dairy? And I have used plain kombucha, no flavors, and plain kombucha works just as well. Okay. Um, people have asked me if they can use coconut yogurt or cashew yogurt. While I have not tried that myself, the principle seems to make sense. And I said, right. Uh, yeah, sure. Try it. It should work. And if you do try it, um, circle back to me and let me know what you find. And I think a few people have said that it worked. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, so it was one of those experiments where I got mold on the starter because like I said, I did have a little bit mold on an apple that I haven't seen. And right. And then I got mold on the starter. I'm like, Ooh, Okay, so this can happen. It happened to me too. Here's my little initiation. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I haven't had it happen. And so I get lots of questions and I'm like, I none of this has happened to me. It's just been very robust and easy. I mean, on to be completely honest, it just has. I've had fruit flies in it and people are like, Well, what do you do then? Yeah. I'm like, I scoop them out. I'm just being completely honest. Yeah, right? I'm not gonna throw in my starter over a couple of fruit flies. Oh, I know. I I, I mean I hope I'm not freaking people out, but, you know, as long as we're not eating in my kitchen, I think everything's fine. But I've had so many people comment on stuff that goes on in my kitchen, and that's that's only the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> one video <laughs> in which I'm actually teaching teaching about how to make buttermilk, and one of the cats jumps up on the counter, and somebody commented and says, Ooh, first she touches the cat, because I put the cat back down, and then she touches the food. And then it was funny, because people came and said, well, she wasn't touching the food, it was in a jar. Oh, <laughs> and um, so. you can't gross me out on you. Trust me. <laughs> I know. I'm just not one to waste stuff that fast. Like no, and I <laughs> I also don't believe that. I mean, we are living in such a sanitary environment these days, and everything is like germ free yes. and this and that. And I, first of all, I don't think that people have lived that way. You know, a hundred years, and then and then even prior to that. And no. secondly, I used to say about my kids, because I started them all clean in the morning and then, you know, midday they were all dirty and sticking sticking their hands in the sandbox and then their mouth. And and I was never one of those moms that would run over there and, you know, Clorox wipe their hands. And, and I said, oh, my no. kids are dirty, but they're happy. And they had a very robust immune system. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. My mom wasn't like that either. Yeah, we we. I mean, you know, you know how kids are. If you're going to get grossed out about like certain, like a cat jumping up on the counter, just look at like, even when you're a very particular mom, your kids still, the second you turn your, your head this way, they're doing something that's like, oh, they could survive that. I know. And I wasn't (laughs) going to drive myself crazy. And you know, there's one day my, my oldest son, he's like five or six and he's like, mom, 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 look. And I look over there and he has his mouth wide open and he has a dog licking the inside of his mouth. Do I need that? Do I promote it? No, of course not. <laughs> no, but... Was I freaked out by it? I'm like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I and I think, well, I know that there's studies that kids that grow up with pets are healthier than, than kids that don't grow up with pets. Yeah. Well, and just living on a farm, too, there's so much about it that makes you be like, well, I guess that's fine. Like, no matter how much you clean a cow before getting the milk out of the cow, you're oh, yeah. still squeezing the teats of a cow that just pooped. I mean, you just are. And that's the same for everybody, whether you're getting your milk from the store or yes. you're not. You're getting the, the eggs out of the coop. And, right. you know, it's just there is you might get them yeah. all sanitized. But before that, it came from a cow. So let's let's just remember right. that there right. are some things that. Yeah, we'll go on some rants here. Yeah, I, I actually these days I'm a little bit more like, you know, I appreciate a little bit of dirt in my home and I don't need it all sanitary. It's not like I'm a surgery room over here where that's necessary. Right. So, right. Yeah. And I think that, um, sourdough is, is bacteria. 
it's just good bacteria. Mm-hmm. And right. I think that bacteria has such a bad rep and just the, the word bacteria, you know, so you have to call it good bacteria. So, and even in the gut, you know, you want the good, you want to cultivate your good bacteria and make sure that the unbeneficial bad bacteria don't overwhelm the good bacteria. But here's an interesting um, anecdote. And um, some of you listening may have heard this. If not, it's really a fun story. And I hope I'm telling it right. Michael Pollan wrote a book and he talked about this nun on the East Coast that happened to be a biochemist. And she was making a certain type of cheese. She went to France, learned how to make it and made it. And then the FDA came and said, well, you can't make that cheese in these wooden vats because that's not sanitary and yada, yada, yada. So she said, fine, I'm going to run an experiment. We're going to do the same cheese, everything, same recipe. And I'm going to do it in wooden vats. And I'm going to do another vat in absolutely sanitary stainless steel vats. And they found that they actually did grow E. coli in the stainless steel vats because what happens is that in the little creases of the wooden vats, the good bacteria overwhelmed the bad bacteria Mm -hmm. and those weren't available in the stainless steel vats. So the FDA said, okay, fine, you can do whatever you do. Yeah, (laughs) that that just seems just like the milk industry, I guess you could say. (laughs) There, that is how we do with milk. When we kill every last bit of bacteria, there's no line of defense. And if you actually do the research, I mean, I I probably am like going to butcher these statistics. I won't share statistics, but that's a whole topic. We have been drinking raw milk for years. I love it. I love the taste. And I think, you know, it's perfect the way it comes out. Why would I alter it? And um, there's, I mean, I've read all sorts of studies as to um, how it has enzymes in it that actually helps mm-hmm. digest the milk proteins and the, the lactose in it. And if you're um, dairy sensitive, there's a lot of people who actually do fine on raw milk because it hasn't been altered. So anyway, so that's a whole different topic. And um, yeah, <laughs> it is, but it's an important topic because I do find a lot of people are scared of sourdough. They're scared of they're scared of raw milk. They're scared of fermenting vegetables because it's so unfamiliar to grow bacteria that they want some kind of metric to know that it's going to be okay when this is a very wild process and there might not be anything giving you that, that, you know, conventional sanitized down type of outcome that's going to make you be like, yes, this has all the right bacteria in it. In a way you have to trust the process. And so I think that that's how this does tie into this conversation. Right. And I mean, ultimately, I feel like people need to know, people need to do whatever they're comfortable with. And if they're not, if they're just plain not comfortable with drinking, let's say raw milk, I I respect that. And I'm like, fine, right. But I also read a lot of research, because I'm like, well, what is it, you know, and um, where does it fall? So first of all, I think that the whole pasteurization of milk came up because the cows were so far away from the people consuming the milk that they the milk had to be transported. And so they had cows in industrial operations where they couldn't guarantee the cleanliness. And then they had to transport it and the milk would go bad on the way to the cities because, you know, people started living in more urban environments. And that's where the pasteurization came in. But if you, I mean, I find that my raw milk stays good in the refrigerator for 10 days and it's been chilled the whole time and we don't cook it and I smell it and I drink it Mm -hmm. and it's fine. We haven't gotten sick. So yeah, but I know a lot of people who are like, but it's not pasteurized. It's like, how, how, why does it not make you sick? I'm like, well, I mean, it doesn't. And uh, yeah, no. (laughs) There's just the fences left there. There are good bacteria everywhere. And in, in sourdough, that they're there and you're cultivating them and, and they're there in that milk and they're there in vegetables. And that is what this whole thing is about. They're everywhere. So, they're yeah, everywhere. it makes a lot of sense when you really think about the science yeah, behind yeah. it. Taking another quick break to tell you about the School of Traditional Skills. I've told you about this on this podcast before, but I have had a chance to dive into some of the classes and they are so well done and so informational. They're packed with what you need to preserve food, build a garden, dairy, homesteading, fermenting, all of the topics that a lot of you, if you listen to this podcast, are probably interested in. The School of Traditional Skills is the perfect way to continue to learn those skills because they are constantly adding new classes, all very well done. They have pressure canning, reclaiming pasture, pasteurizing meat chickens, gardening, 
curing pork, a nourishing bone broth class with Sally Fallon Morell. You can get all of this by visiting bit.ly forward slash farmhouse skills. Again, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash farmhouse skills. Sign up for the School of Traditional Skills and continue to get their classes, learn new things that you can implement in your home that will help you to be more self-sustaining, save you money. So much good information over there. I am looking forward to continuing to watch all of their classes as they put them out. Again, that's bit.ly forward slash farmhouse skills. What are some of your most frequently asked questions that you get when it comes to sourdough? We might have covered a few. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I get so many questions. Again, this is like a little plug. This is why I created my sourdough course, because I got so many questions. And I felt like, you know, I'm so busy answering them. So maybe I need to, like, bundle them and, you know, wrap them up all nicely for people. So that is all in one spot. Yeah. I get everything from, so when you take it out of the refrigerator, do you cover it or do you leave it uncovered? Or when you keep in the refrigerator, do you have a tight lid on it or not? And so just to answer that. In the refrigerator, I will actually put a tight lid on it. I have one of those, what do you call them? The corking jars from Ikea, you know, that have a little rubber gasket and then this like flip top. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty airtight. Yes. And just because, you know, I have other ferments in my refrigerator and I don't want any cross contamination right. between either one of them. But then once I take it out, I, I may loosely cover it so I don't get fruit flies in it or because we have cats and run around and they jump up on the counter and then, you know, I don't want cat hair in the sourdough starter. So that's why I loosely cover it, but you don't need to cover it very tightly. Right. And then I get all sorts of questions for like, how much flour do you put in it? And um, I don't think I have a one question that people ask. I'm trying to think. I don't think so. I mean, it just runs the gamut from everything from, can you use stainless utensils? Yes, you can. You know, yes. I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> keep it in there for long, but I use my, actually, we have heirloom silver that we use for every day, and I use that to stir up my sourdough starter and it hasn't hurt it at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm still trying to think if there's, while I'm talking in the back of my head, I'm thinking if there's any one question that stands out or is like more common than any other. Well, the mold question. Mm -hmm. And I do tell people to make sure that they have a clean jar. And by that, I don't necessarily mean sterilized, like boiled in water for 10 minutes or, you know, chlorinated, but just clean. Right. Because apparently soap residue can also hurt your sourdough starter if you're making one that's not right. robust yet. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, what are your top five favorite sourdough recipes? I know that your your wheat is that a that traditional German bread mm -hmm. you're making. Is that a wheat bread? The way my grandmother always made it, and the way my mom is still making it, it's wheat. But these days, I'm like, oh, einkorn, oat, rye, spelt, you know, whatever. And there were right. years when I had millet in there, and amaranth, and quinoa, and all sorts of other interesting grains. And um, I mean, this is a recipe I feel like I can do anything with. So yeah, that's, I, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I play with it all the time. And uh, just recently I found, um, oh yeah, because people sometimes ask me both ways, either I like this extra sour bread. How do I get my sour, my bread a little bit more sour? Or people ask me, I want the sourdough, but I don't like the sour taste. So then I ask them, what's your purpose of eating sourdough bread? Well, for health benefits. I'm like, well, you do need to ferment it, but there are ways that you can increase and decrease the sourness. And I find that adding right. about 25% or so of oat to my whole mm -hmm. grain sourdough bread makes it very mild. That's a recipe I've been playing with lately. Yeah. Coming soon to the blog. Um... <laughs> I feel like it's it's just Maybe. another variation. <laughs> well, I have the the hundred percent rye right. because that is that is a, a different recipe in itself, and you know rye behaves a little bit because it doesn't have the gluten that wheat and spelt and einkorn does. I mean, so yeah, I mean in that order, different. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I I just feel like you know the, the this recipe is so flexible. You can just throw anything in there yeah. you want. Yeah, that makes it very intuitive and easy. All right. Let our listeners know where they can best yeah. find you. Tell us about your sourdough course or any way that we can follow up with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd love for people to check me out um, on my blog again, ourgabledhome.com 
or on YouTube. Now that's very easy. Our Gables Home. I'm on Instagram. I'm officially on Twitter, but not very active there. I'm on Pinterest. I'm on Facebook. And then I do have the sourdough course. And I think you can just go ahead and type in a Google search and type in super simple sourdough online course, and you should be able to find it. Okay. It's not a very uh, long course, but it has all the little modules and it teaches you how to make the sourdough starter and pitfalls and troubleshooting. And you, you know, I mean, even though I have some videos on my YouTube channel, I really go in depth in the course and talk about all sorts of things, including recipes. And then you also get access to my private face. I have a private Facebook group for the sourdough course oh, cool. where people can share and get support and, and get more of my attention because sometimes I get people who ask me this and that and, you know, and I don't know, and I got this funny color and it's so difficult for me to remotely assess, you know, funny color can mean so many things. And yeah. in the private Facebook group, it would be really easy for people or it is really easy for them to share a photo or a video, which we can't do on YouTube, for right. example. So I can, I can look on it and then just... Yes, the back and forth is very helpful. Yeah, and then just recently I've added the coaching because people have actually, well, chastised me for, you know, you're teaching all this thing and then you're, you're you know, you're leaving people alone. I'm like, well, <laughs> so I've just recently launched a coaching service where people can get 20 minutes of my attention and we can Zoom and they can be in their kitchen. They can show me their sourdough starter. They can show me their setup. They can show me whatever they have. And they can ask me all their sourdough related that's questions cool. so that yeah. they don't feel like I leave them hanging. Yeah, I do feel like that's missing sometimes. And people people ask for it, but there's only so much time in the day to take right. everybody's individual sourdough questions. Right, right. And again, and that's why I did the course because I'm like, I'm so busy answering all the YouTube comments. And so often I will just um, steer people towards my course and say, hey, you know, I think you would get so much out of this course and it answers all your questions. So you might want to consider that. Yeah, because you only have so many hours in a day. Right. And even yeah. though I wish I I had more and I could respond to every comment that way, I, I just don't, you know. Yeah. No, it's fair. It's fair. All right. Well, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. You had a lot of good insight. For somebody who maybe has tried Sardo and still hasn't found something that works for them, they're discouraged, this is a whole new way to look at it and try it. So thank you so much for giving us that information. Yeah. And, and, you know, likewise, thank you so much for having me here. I always love chatting with you whenever we do. And um, I may actually, I, I think I've made a commitment that I will try one of those sourdough starters and maybe I'll just use your recipe where, you know, I feed it and I discard and I try one of those methods and see how I like it. And if it's any different, if I... <laughs> that old way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just venture out and try something, yeah. you know, what maybe 90% of the population of this country does. And so I, I have a better understanding of how that works. So... Thank you so much. It's it's hard to want to switch up what you know, you know? It really is. Like, this works for you. It's easy. And yeah. Teaching an old I dog would, Yeah, trick. that's hard to... <laughs> but, but worthwhile to try for your... Probably for your course students. A good way to get, like, more... Yeah. Yes. Both experiences. Yeah, and then, you know, if I... Whatever I find, I may... I may actually... If it's worth it, I, I'll always update the course and, you know, put that in there. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. I hope that you did learn something new about sourdough. I know I learned some things and I, I don't know, I don't know if I'll change my method just because it works so well for me. But for any of you who maybe have tried and not had the best of luck with it, this gives you something else to try so that you can join the sourdough club and bake from scratch with wild yeast I hope that it encouraged you. As always, thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. <laughs>